You are listening to the Business Bootcamp Podcast. Today on the Listen While You Work edition, we're going to be going over three videos, but if you want to check out the full videos, head over to Mike Andy's on YouTube, especially on this first one, we're going through an old motel to see exactly what Mike did to raise the property value by over $500,000 over the course of six months. We're also going to take a look and see what he did to save his gym throughout the pandemic and how he's actually made it more profitable post pandemic. We're going to touch on the few things that actually move the needle for your business and why most owners are wasting their time. But without further ado, let's get into it. Hey everyone, today is a bit of a different video. I'm going to be talking about real estate. Uh, I'm actually in one of the apartment complexes that I purchased about six months ago. I'm going to be walking through with you exactly what I've done over the past six months to improve the equity of this property by over $500,000 and how I'm using the equity to actually improve my businesses. So where I'm at right now is actually kind of like the storage locker area slash a laundry room for this facility. So there's not any sort of washer dryers in any of the units, but here we have a storage facility for each of the units. You can see the numbers here corresponding with each of the units. This is a 10 unit apartment complex. I purchased this in October of 2021. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna show you around today. I'm gonna show you what we do and uh, what we've done to improve the place. So in this room, we had to light it up. So we brought some more lights in, uh, obviously trying to make it just a nice place for the, the tenants to be. Liz is the property manager here. She gets a percentage of all the rents in exchange for all the work that she does. <clears throat> so obviously these are uh, the type of stuff that we would put around here. But we put it here for the tenants, try to make it a nice place. And we make a about $150 per month from the coin operated laundry. It's not a lot, like we're definitely not trying to make a bunch of money. It's 75 cents for a dryer and a dollar for uh, a washer. And, and like, honestly, I don't plan on raising that. And so uh, this is kind of a nice place and we actually give them quite a bit of stuff just to be able to help the tenants, uh, kind of a wash basin here. So just kind of clean this place up, make it look a little bit nicer, brought in some lights. It was a little bit dingy and dark. Mercy, you got water down here. That's not good. This looks like there might be a leak. Hmm, look at this. This is interesting. All right, so I'm gonna actually have to take a look at this because there is some water you can see right here sitting right up against the hot water heater. So I don't think this is, anything's wrong with this one. Um, these are both actually relatively new, only a couple years old. There might be a leak somewhere in the bottom of this sink. <sighs> Anyways, I'll have to take that, take a look at that, let Liz know. Um, but definitely some standing water. Just a tiny little puddle right there. It could actually honest, honestly just be someone spilt something. It's literally just sitting right here. Could have been like uh, someone just spilled some water. But anyways, uh, let me go ahead and show you outside. There is someone moving in today. So I want to be a discreet, obviously. Uh, no one out here knows I'm the owner. I do live here in one of the apartments. It's a one bedroom, one bath. So um, I'll show you outside though, kind of some of the things that we did. I do gotta be quiet because it's actually a really nice and quiet neighborhood where this is at. And so they'll be able to hear me. So I just gotta be careful. So let me go ahead and show you outside here. Turn off the light. So what we have is five units over on this side and then five units over on this side. You can see someone's moving today into unit number two. Uh, and it's a two bedroom, one bath. One thing that we still do need to do is paint the lines. You can see it's very hard to uh, you know, see any lines for the parking. We're gonna improve that and uh, just make it a little bit nicer, uh, but we gotta wait for the weather to improve. As you can see, it's still March and uh, lots of rain we still have. We cleaned this all up. This was an absolute mess. This tree was all the way down. All this was overgrown and you couldn't see from one side of the property to the other. So we just cleaned all of that out and uh, just try to make it improve it. Once the spring rolls around, we'll probably put some mulch down and make it a little bit nicer. But then we also, in terms of the landscaping, installed this fenced area. This is a way for us to be able to have People put their pets in here or, you know, let them run around, uh, get some steam off for their kids. Uh, and then obviously over here, you can see some of the tents moving in and out here. But yeah, five units on the side. Half of them are two bedroom, half of them are one bedroom. And uh, we don't do a lot in terms of renovating them. These are 1970 units. So I'm not going to try to over improve them and make them... 2000 or $2,500 per month rentals. Uh, we take these and we try to make them for a family, affordable housing. And honestly, in, in our area, anything under $2,000 per month for rent is actually relatively cheap. 
The main reason that I actually bought this property is the fact that across the street is a really, really nice private school. And this whole neighborhood, there's really not a lot of apartments. This is like the only apartments. If you look down the street, it's all just residential, single family homes. And so to have an apartment complex in this area, I actually think back in the day, this used to be a motel. Uh, it used to, it's zoned for it. And I haven't you know, really gone back in a whole lot, but I, I guarantee it was used for that in the past. It's built in the 1970s. That's what the asphalt siding is, which I'm not super a big fan of. Uh, it looks old and dated, but we just, we just do not spend over improve on the property. So when we try to fix up a unit, we spend, you know, 10, 15, $20,000 putting in quartz. We put some new carpet, we paint the place up. But uh, you can see a unit here like this number one, we haven't done anything to because those, uh, those uh, blinds are thin and the cheap ones, whereas this number two here, it has the uh, nice blinds and then the front door has been changed. And we really had to bring in some light in here uh, just to kind of make sure that it's safe. And so we brought the lights in, you can see it right there, uh, lights. And, but again, this is from the other angle here. We gotta get these lines redone. We trimmed all these shrubs back. This tree used to be growing over the entire uh, parking lot here. So we trimmed that way back. I brought some more lights in, like I said, and these are the other units here. Again, half of them are two bedroom, half of them are one bedroom. This is it. So basically what happened is these rents previously were a way under market rent. And so I purchased the property for $1.8 million. I put about uh, $800,000 down and then a million dollars on in debt. It's a commercial loan because it's 10 units. Again, you can see here, this is like a completely residential market uh, and neighborhood. And then also there's a really nice, another uh, really nice school right there. So anyways, um, it's really quiet. I love this neighborhood. And what's really cool is literally five minutes from here is the main hospital for our county. And uh, the other two minutes away is like malls and very much downtown Bellingham. So uh, it's great, great location. Now what we're actually gonna do with this number 10 unit, which they just moved out yesterday, we're gonna completely gut it, renovate it, and then I'm gonna do an Airbnb. Uh, first and foremost to learn, secondarily because I think we could easily get $125 per night and book it really solid because of traveling nurses for the hospital. So um, looking forward to that, that's gonna be number 10 right behind me there and we'll be renovating that throughout April. So yeah, we purchased the place for $1.8 million and currently it's well worth 2.3 million. Mostly due to the fact that a forced appreciation, just cleaning the place up, getting some lights on here, a painting, like all the little basic things. More importantly, it was the increase in rents. So when I bought it, it was about a four and a half cap. So if we assume that a four and a half cap is still what we would use for this property today, which in our area now three and three and a half is being used, but let's just say it's four and a half. We have almost doubled the rents um, on all these units from seven, $800 per month in rent to 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There's someone paying $1,700 per month in rent on a two bedroom, two bath in here. And yeah, we have to put, you know, 10, 15, $20,000 in each unit to improve those. But the, the amount that we were able to get, the return on that investment is fantastic. So this is a great property. Um, I have not sold it. I have not realized $500,000 in gains. I don't plan on doing so because if I do so, I'm gonna have to pay a bunch of taxes. Uh, rather what I have done is that increase in $500,000 in equity. I still have that $800,000 in cash in the property, which essentially means I've paid off 70% of the value of this property, which means I can go get a loan backed up buy this property with all the equity and that's what we've done in order to be able to grow Augusta Lawn Care and my other businesses uh, as we were scaling up and it requires a lot of cash that's what we're using uh, this real estate for is to be able to make loans against that equity so it's kind of what we're doing and I like to show this because I do believe that as business owners we can get so locked into our business and what we do and our equipment and our trucks and all the rest of it and we've got to realize that at the end of the day we are investors and we are building our business like a investment tool like a machine and uh, you have the alternative of of spending money in your business is spending money on real estate or stocks or bonds or things like that. And you start looking at your business as an investor instead of as someone who mows grass or someone who does landscaping. If you start thinking like that, your returns will be better. You'll become more, much more of an educated investor. And when I look at our franchisees at Augusta Lawn Care and everyone in Augusta Nation, I don't look at it as like, okay, let's go mow grass. And I was like, learn how to great, build a great lawn care business. That's great. But in three to five years, when someone's joined Augusta Lawn Care, they're gonna be starting to think about, okay, like, where do I put this money? I expect after five, six years, someone to have a business that's generating a lot of profit. Well, where do we put that profit in a way that is most tax efficient? Because it's not gonna be necessarily uh, just putting in a savings account. It's going to be taxed at 30, 40% if I do that. Whereas if I can uh, figure out how to put it into 
real estate or in the stocks or building a second business or building a second or third location of Augusta Lawn Care, if we can learn how to teach them how to do that, that will allow them to preserve that wealth without spending a whole bunch of money on taxes. So that's the goal. That's why I've bought 20 units uh, like this over the past couple of years to learn the game and be able to teach our franchisees at Augusta Lawn Care over the next several years as they become more established and more profitable. So thank you all so very much. Hope that was helpful and a little educational for you. Take care. Have a great day. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys to look at your business and your investments as a tool to propel yourselves into the future. But before we get into how Mike saved his gym throughout the pandemic and what he did to actually increase revenue, I want to talk about home service web design. If you guys have a home service business and you're needing a fresh website with up-to-date SEO, home service web design is the place for you. Our team over there creates professional looking websites all at an affordable monthly rate. So check that out, home service web design, but let's get into here how Mike actually saved his gym and what they're doing since then to increase profitability overall. Let's get into it. And in that moment, I said, look, if we're gonna differentiate ourselves, we gotta zero in and double down on the thing that makes us different. Hey everyone, my name is Mike Andy. Today I'm gonna to be sharing with you how exactly I not only saved my gym, but actually made it more profitable after the COVID-19 pandemic. About two years ago, COVID-19 came to the United States and absolutely obliterated the gym industry. We had to close down for three solid months. When we reopened, there were so many restrictions, it was absolutely ridiculous. People had to wear masks, but in addition to that, we had to like do spacers and dividers, and it was just absolutely insanity. And then, literally after a couple months of being open in that capacity, they wanted us to close down again. We did not close down the second time. I had had enough of it by that point. But for three months, we had to close the doors to the club, and we could not accept any payment for memberships that were on an, a monthly basis. Prior to COVID, we would charge people about 40 to $45 per month for their gym membership. And we had to stop that literally after a week of being closed. And then for the next three months, we did not collect a single dollar in membership dues. So how did we get through that? And then how did we actually, over the past two years, not only come back and save the gym, but actually now be more profitable, make more money in terms of top line revenue, and our margins are much, much improved. So here are the four things. The first one is that what I wanted to do is that when the club opened back up, I wanted to be where we had raised our prices to the point, and this can be used in any business, where a customer has to stop when they're making a buying decision, when they're comparing two different products or services, and they have to actually like think, like, why is this so much more expensive? In the past, our club had been about $40 per month in terms of cost. Well, our nearest competition was maybe $20, $30 per month. So it's relatively comparatively the same. And someone would only come to our club, maybe if we were a little more convenient to come to our specific location. However, what I wanted to do is actually raise the prices towards like more like 55 or $60 per month to use the gym as a member, mostly due to the fact that I wanted people to realize that this price dis discrepancy, they were gonna get a different experience and they're gonna get a different quality of product by coming to our facility. And so we raised prices literally during the months when we were closed and everyone else was worried about Peloton and people working out at home forever. And in that moment, I said, look, if we're gonna differentiate ourselves, we gotta zero in and double down on the thing that makes us different. And we're gonna raise our prices, not lower them, we're gonna raise them. So I wanted to make sure that the same way that you would take a watch and maybe it's $50 for a watch. Well, the exact same watch that tells the exact same time could be $50,000 if it's just a different brand and it's made in a much more quality manner. And so I wanted to become the Rolls Royce, the Rolex of the gym in our local market. The gyms in our local market could be 10, 15, $20 per month in terms of membership dues on the low end. I wanted to be on the high end. I wanted people to actually have to stop and not be able to compare apples to oranges. There had to be something different and then use that extra margin to do things that none of those other gyms could do. So the first thing was raising prices to the point where people could not compare our product and service against other clubs. This is what we call the E-Volt room. So you get the banner up here, and then basically you stand on this, you get scanned, and then you get a printout. If you look like this, you're able to see your lean body mass, body fat mass, visceral fat, just a whole bunch of really good calculations for uh, scanning your body left and right, composition, and then gives you a bio age, uh, BWI score, a whole bunch of really cool stuff, and you can track this really well. It's better than just tracking just your weight. It tracks actually like your body composition over the course of time as you're working out, and it's all through bioelectrical impedance. So uh, basically measuring how fast electrical currents go through the body. Obviously, fat and muscle, water, are going to affect that speed, so pretty cool stuff. 
The second thing that we did at the club in order to make it stronger after two years of COVID is that we changed the billing frequency. Now, this is in every business, the determining factor of what should we charge a customer and then when should we bill the consumer? And so in the past, we had charged them on a monthly basis. What that meant is because it's on a subscription model where they have to sign a contract for 12 or 24 months to become a member is that I would get 12 billing cycles for the year. Now, what we did is we switched to bi-weekly because first off, it lowered in the perceived cost to the consumer because instead of charging $50 per month, $25 every two weeks, even though it theoretically is about the same amount, it seems a lot cheaper in the mind of the customer, especially when those bi-weekly prices that we have are comparable to the monthly prices of our competitors. Now, by changing the billing frequency from monthly to bi-weekly, we didn't just double the amount of times that we would bill someone in the year. We actually made more money by simply charging bi-weekly. Here, let me explain. So if I'm charging someone monthly, that would mean I'd be I'm able to bill them 12 times in the year. Now, when I switch to bi-weekly, it doesn't go to 24. Do the math, if there's 52 weeks in the year and I bill every other week, it means I get 26 billing cycles in the year. Essentially, I get two extra billing cycles when I charge on a bi-weekly basis. Essentially, if that's $25, that means an extra $50 per customer per year, which means if I have a thousand consumers, a thousand gym goers, and I'm able to get $50 from every single one per year, that's $50,000 in extra revenue. And by the way, I didn't do anything. And in the mind of the consumer, $25 biweekly is almost the same as $50 per month. When in reality, it made the club an extra $50,000 in sheer profit simply by changing the billing frequency. The third thing that we did in the club was cut out the, our least profitable customers. Now, when it comes to the gym industry, there's what's called PPV or pay per visit. And these are sponsored programs from insurance companies that typically pay a couple dollars per time someone visits the club. The problem with this is if someone does not use the facility, we wouldn't make a single penny. So even though they would come in, we would sign them up, maybe we'd make 50 or $60 on the sign up and we'd sell them a key fob to be able to get 24 seven access because the money was not coming from them, but rather their insurance company, there was no urgency for them to even use the facility, see great results or become part of the community. Therefore, they might sign up and use the club once or twice every year or never show up again. And we didn't want that for the community, the club, and we didn't want it for the fact that someone could literally be a member and pay us a dollar or two dollars per month. While at the same time, there's someone else that signed a 24 month contract and is paying us $50, $60 per month out of their paycheck. So I didn't feel like it was fair that one person pays $50, $60 per month, and yet they have to potentially wait on the, a restroom or a shower or a treadmill when we got really busy because someone was using the facility that was literally paying a couple dollars to be there. And potentially we might get $10 a month from them if they use this on a weekly basis. So what we did was weed out those PPV pay per visit members. We canceled all the insurance programs and that made a lot of people unhappy because a lot of these people are older silver sneaker members and individuals that are on a fixed income. So what we did is a compromise is we offered a lower monthly subscription cost for members to switch from pay per visit into an actual subscription and an actual membership that we controlled and was not going through a third party like an insurance company. Company. Another reason why we did this is during COVID-19 when we were closed down, these insurance companies that would had these programs with the gyms literally charged us money to keep the program open and then advertised to our members with free at home videos to be able to keep their workouts going. It was absolutely crazy. A lot of gym owners hated it and it put a lot of really bad taste in our mouths as gym owners when the people that are supposed to be telling the members to come to us, we're telling them not to come into the gym and rather just stay at home. Therefore, saving the insurance company money, but absolutely not in the best interest of the gym owners. We also cut out trial passes. So in the past, people would always advertise seven day passes that were free. And the idea was that you'd be able to get someone in to use a facility and they'd try it out and they'd like it and they'd sign up for a membership. The problem was like literally less than 10% of people that did a trial membership became a member. Yet you'd have to have them sign a waiver and you'd have to make sure that they came to the club only during staffed hours. Now, what was kind of funny is the fact that because of COVID-19, we were able to use it as an excuse as to why we were not allowing trial trial members because all of our other members have a key fob, we have security clearance, we have a picture of them and all the rest of it. Whereas 
these trial members, we didn't know who they were really, and we didn't want them in the club during the pandemic. Well, we just kept that right on going. We realized that having trial members was not the best interest of the club. It was usually used by students, people on vacation, and people that just wanted a quick workout, not people that would potentially become members down the road. By doing this, it also allowed our staff to focus on our members and not constantly chasing the next trial member, the next person that comes in for a day or two. And they were always the one making the issues in the club and causing the headache. And so we just immediately cut them out, therefore eliminating a lot of the time wasted signing them up on the trial passes, as well as cleaning up after them. They were the ones that would leave the bathrooms and the showers always looking gross, and we'd have to end up cleaning up after them. So it was just overall win-win, and we kind of used COVID as a guise for getting rid of the trial pass. The fourth and final thing that we did to save the club and actually bring it back to making more money today than it did two years ago is that we focused on training. And when we focused on training, not only did we hire back all the trainers, we actually hired an additional trainer during COVID. When we were closed down, we hired another trainer. The reason we did this is because I realized that instead of trying to raise the cost of the membership incrementally by a couple dollars, what I should be trying to do is instead of getting 50 or $60 per month from a member, I should make the value of that customer $500, $600 per month by offering very intense training programs, whether it be personal training or group training. So we actually more than tripled the price of our group training packages. In the past, we would charge $99 per month to be part of a group training package. We changed that to over $370 per month after COVID-19. You say, well, why did you do that? Well, all of a sudden we were able to have smaller groups. The trainers were able to spend more time with the member and therefore they got better results. They were held to accountability and they were able to have better scans. We invested in a scanner that did a body scan and would get all of the fat and water weight and all the different metrics of the body. We invested all of that to make the train experience better. You can't just slap a Rolex logo onto a $50 watch and expect it to sell for more. You do have to make the product better. And so during that time when we were closed, not only did we renovate the gym, make it better, buy more equipment, we also purchased things that would make the training experience a lot better for the customer. And we really started to advertise the fact that we were a training facility. We weren't just a 24-7 gym, we were going to really try to focus on selling the customer that would be worth $400, $500 per month instead of just the regular gym goer that would be about $50 to $60 per month. Effectively, 8, 9, 10xing the amount of revenue we could get from one customer. When you have a constraint like you do in a gym with space, the goal is to maximize the amount of money that you can get from every single customer. For the gym, we only have so much space. It's about 7,000 square feet. You can only fit so many members inside. So once you hit saturation and you filled the gym up, your goal shouldn't be trying to sell more memberships. It should become, how do I take an existing member and make them of a higher value? So not only do we more than triple the price of our training packages, we also invested in supplement programs to be able to take an existing customer and sell them supplements that would allow them to become a higher value to the gym. Two years after COVID, I'm very happy to say that our team has been able to sell back to pre-COVID levels of membership and our training is about two to three X more in terms of revenue per month that we get from that. Plus the supplement sales, we're now much more profitable, make more money in terms of revenue and looking forward to the future has for the club. Hopefully that was a good perspective on how you can take your existing customers and make each one more profitable for your business instead of just focusing on customer acquisition all the time and trying to just get as many people in the door as possible. But before we jump into the next segment about the two things that actually move the needle for your business, I want to let you know that we have a new website up, MikeAndies.com, home of everything Mike Andy's from the podcast to the videos to the blog and all of the different services that we offer. So check that out, MikeAndies.com, and stay up to date with everything we got going on over here. But let's get into this next segment and hear how you can actually focus on acquisitions and fulfillment to improve your business overall. Here we go. I believe that about 90% of what we do every single day and the things that we busy ourselves with as business owners actually do not move the needle. And really, if we just put those things aside, there's only a couple things in your business that actually matter and are actually going to change the future of the business. I like to group everything that happens in daily operations and where I'm spending my time in the business on two different areas. One is acquisition. That is prior to someone becoming a customer, marketing, advertising, the sales process, estimate process, whatever it is. And the other side is fulfillment. And fulfillment is going to be after the sale has been consummated. And this in terms is operational and technologically and HR and your equipment, 
all of that stuff is all fulfillment. And most entrepreneurs fall in love with the acquisition side. We love marketing. We love growth. We like getting new customers. And then if you're really operationally strong, you usually enjoy hiring. You enjoy making things really efficient. You don't like a lot of change. You like making things really, really systems oriented. You're really good at organization. And so knowing that is typically how you're going to hire. If you're a really driven CEO that loves the sales side of things, you might need to hire someone that's more operationally strong and is gonna add some systems and structure to the business and be able to hire, be a good leader, et cetera, and vice versa. And then occasionally you'll have an entrepreneur that can somewhat do both in terms of both be a good acquisition as well as fulfillment. Now, all of that to say that when you look at your day of what you spend your time on, I would say that 90 to 95% of the things you do actually don't change the future of the business. They don't actually move the needle. And really what you should be focusing on is how do I make my five, 10% of my day that I am spending on the highest value decisions in the business, how do I optimize that? Jeff Bezos is really famous for saying, one thing that I thought was really interesting. He says he usually makes maybe one or two decisions a day that actually are important. And he said the rest of his day, whether or not he's busy or not, doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, those one or two decisions that he makes is going to lead to the greatest results. And so whether it means he needs to optimize his sleep, whether that means he needs to clear his schedule and not take interviews or whatever it is, he needs to optimize his day to make really good decisions once or twice a day. What that means is the other 95 things he might do in a day, meetings he might take really don't matter a whole lot to the business's success. And when we zero step back to small businesses, because obviously we are not running fortune 500 companies like Jeff Bezos did. However, when we look at our small business, I truly believe that most of us spend 90% of our time worrying, thinking about strategizing, creating plans, budgeting around things that actually don't move the needle. We talk about trucks and type of equipment and what our uniforms are going to be and what our business card looks like and all these things in our business that actually don't move the needle. What type of blades we use, what type of string line we use, uh, what type of mowers and, and tires and type of snow plow and the brand we use, like the fuel type, electric, gas. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. If you actually look at your business and where it's going to be in five years, do those things actually move the needle? Probably not. And I truly believe the reason that bogs so many small business owners down, including myself, is the fact that we actually use those 90% of things that don't move the needle as a safeguard to not address the five or 10% of things that need to be dealt with and need to be changed and need attention in the business. For example, if you know that hiring and HR is your weak point, you might get, make sure you're really busy with the technological side of the business or the systems or organization or equipment or something else in the business and spend all your time on that as a safeguard to make sure you don't have the time to actually focus on the thing that's going to move the needle for the business, which is hiring HR and building a team. And so what I would recommend, what I would suggest is that the things that you're doing all throughout your day that you're so busy doing that because you are so busy doing them, you don't have time for the things that actually are going to move the needle for the business. And we use that busyness and all those tasks that are 90% of our day as a way to block out our calendar from actually being able to slot in the things that are going to move the needle. And I can't tell you what going to move the needle is going to be for you, but what I would ask yourself is, am I over indexing on acquisition versus fulfillment? If you really enjoy doing the work, you're probably really good at fulfillment. If you really enjoy getting new customers and growing the business, you probably over index towards acquisition and getting more customers. So what you got to ask yourself is, do I, as a form of coping mechanism, make sure I fill my schedule with acquisition and getting more customers simply because I don't want to deal with my team. I don't want to have hard conversations. I don't want to focus on hiring. I don't want to focus on equipment. And therefore I just over index on sales and the acquisition side or vice versa. Do I so love what I do and the work that I do, whether it be plumbing or electrical or mowing grass or whatever it is, do I over index my focus and my time spent on those things? But the flaw of the business, the part that if I would fix would move the needle the most is that I need to actually focus on marketing. I need to create a great website. I need to create a sales system. I need to simplify it. I need to create systems around my sales process. That is how you step back and start to look at your business as an investor, as a third party and analyze 
where am I going wrong? I talk to so many small business owners that are so busy. And trust me, I know what it's like to be, I'm very busy. But we have to ask ourselves, are we using our calendar and blocking our calendar off with all the things that we like to do, are good at, enjoy doing, care a lot about, but using those as a crutch to keep from doing the things that are actually going to move the business forward. And I highly recommend acquisition fulfillment. Which one do you over index on and what can you do to force yourself to address the five or 10% of those decisions that you're probably pushing off into the corner because you're not good at them, you don't enjoy them, or you somehow feel like you're inferior at doing those tasks. I'm Mike Andes, founder of Augusta Lawn Care. And if any of that was helpful, check out MikeAndes.com. Also, links in the description have a lot more information about different products and services that I offer. And that's going to do it for this week's Listen While You Work edition of the Business Bootcamp Podcast. Thanks for listening.